moderator, members and commissioners of this assembly and our guests, thank you for the opportunity to actually um, introduce you to a friend. Rabbi David Ellis is rabbi at large for Atlantic Canada, where he focuses on the spiritual needs since 1996 of smaller communities from his base here in Halifax. I want you to imagine old time Methodist circuit riders on their trusty horse going off way across the prairie or way across the mountain to, to bring what it is that they would bring to people. Now, picture Rabbi Ellis, who doesn't own a horse and doesn't own a car, not for 40 years, going from Moncton across to Prince Edward Island, taking the ferry back and heading to his beloved Cape Breton to do the work of his ministry amongst his people. Rabbi Ellis has so many hats he wears, and I'll tell you about one of them in a minute. He was a critical member and in some ways still is, because I'm not sure it still exists after COVID, of a, a downtown lectionary group here in Halifax. Uh, he's been part of this uh, group for decades now. And in that group, I learned more about the Apostle Paul and the Book of Romans than I did at seminary. I promise you. In this group, a, a number of us would come early and we'd catch up on the weekly events and Rabbi Ellis would share the work that he loved especially in Cape Breton, which Yamaka, I, I think he's turned Yeah, uh, the Cape Breton Tartan, of course. <laughs> and, and, and I'd say, Rabbi, what have you done this week? And I'd tell him that I was working at the Presbyterian Church of St. David. And he would say, oh, I was visiting a little community in Prince Edward Island. And oh, oh by the way, I, I spent all day yesterday at the Halifax International Security Forum, where he would be found rubbing soldiers, uh, almost shoulders, with American and Canadian top political and military leaders and giving them advice, which he often did. <laughs> now, as the name implies, for we know it from our heritage, Rabbi Ellis is a teacher. Uh, actually, he has a nickname for himself. He's got one for me too, but I won't tell you mine. He's a rabbi troublemaker. <laughs> he actually spends every opportunity to open minds and hearts to what is often unique and most often unusual. I'm quite certain that that's how he'll spend his time with us today. And if you were to spend more time with him in Halifax, I'm confident that you too would end up with an invitation to visit him at his home on Norwood Street, where, where you might find yourself served some of the most, maybe the best, lacquers in the city. Moderator, commissioners, guests, and friends of the assembly, I present to you Rabbi David Ellis. All those approved? <laughs> Against? Not yet, but we'll ask at the end. We'll see what's happening there. Ken, thank you very much for being here. The work is not for you to complete, but neither are you free to desist from it altogether. You've ever heard that? You know who said it? Somebody in my community told me that they worked in Ottawa. They heard Bob Ray say it. I believe Bob Ray's wife is Jewish. And uh, so he apparently put in his vocabulary, the work is not for you to finish, 
but neither are you free to desist from it altogether. Now, Bob Ray was taking that from a book I'm going to talk about here, The Pirkeia Vote, The Chapters of the Father's Death of the Fathers. I'll explain the title in a minute. But uh, let's think about that. We've got a lot of projects here, things to do. So um, I'm going to share this work with you because I'm going to describe a project I've been doing. We haven't had the Halifax thing of late, but there's a man who came here a few years ago from Bermuda. One David Atwood is his name. Wife is Margaret Atwood, not the Margaret Atwood, but her name is the same. But he's from Bermuda. And so I said to myself, oh, Bermuda, that's monkeys and palm trees and coconuts and bananas and things. And I said, wait a minute. This guy is really highly educated. He reads James Joyce's Ulysses. He quotes things. He had a career as a civil servant in Bermuda. And he came to the School of Theology here and he got a degree in ministry. He'd been active in the church in Bermuda for many years, but he came here and got his full degree here. And in the process, he went to the classes in the Hebrew language at the School of Theology here. And I got to know him because he would come by both synagogues in Halifax it, just to hear the service being said in Hebrew. Now, do the people there understand what's going on? No, they don't. But it does the Hebrew there. So he was able to follow it in his own accord in that. I followed him as he went to Prince Edward Island. He has a church over in the outskirts of Charlottetown now. And he kept in touch with me. And he got a group going, and it's a lectionary group, similar to the one we had here in Halifax, except it's done by Zoom nowadays. And so we take the portion of the week, and we've got some interesting people there. We have another very talented minister. We have a professor from the law school. We have a retired doctor. We have an old friend of mine who's a professor of English at the University of Texas at Odessa. And we just get a group of people. We all have open observations and thoughts about the lectionary of the week. And we are not afraid to ask questions. We're not afraid to be critical. Uh, nobody's going to try to do anybody in. But we can ask questions and have that out. And that's kind of the way we do sort of things. And it's the Jewish way. I can get abusive and get out of hand perhaps in that. But it's the Jewish way to look for differences and to look for disputes and things. It's a whole principle about things. So I've been kind of confused by some of the things I've been seeing in your group here. I've been seeing everybody come up and most of it's all kind of unanimous sort of things in this. Let me tell you something. There's something in the Talmud in the second temple period. The Bible itself prescribes the death penalty for certain various events. Theoretically, it's in writing in the Bible. But the Jews do not go by the written Bible. We go by the Bible as it's interpreted by the Jewish tradition of the ages. The sages, the rabbis of the Talmud, whatever you want to call them, we're going to see who they are here in a minute in the ethics of the fathers. But the Bible is not read literally. It's not followed literally. It's only by the interpretation of that. So what the rabbis over the years have done is they have abolished the death penalty in practice, although not in uh, writing. They don't, you don't take out something that's already written in the Bible. You don't amend it. You don't erase it. You don't blot it out. It's written there, but what do you do? You do things around it to effectively deny it, even though it may be still be written that way. So in the time of the Second Temple period, when they still had theoretically the death penalty on the book, but it was never perhaps practiced outright, there was a rule that the death penalty in the Talmud in the time of the Sanhedrin went by a majority vote. It had to have a Sanhedrin of 23 judges, and there had to be a majority of opinion to be able to commit someone to capital punishment. There were many provisions for it, but they had to have a majority opinion of uh, 12 or, or more against uh, the minority. If there was ever a vote for conviction of the person that was unanimous, all 23, 23 to zero, the person was acquitted. Now, why does that say? But it was unanimous. Nobody was disagreed with it. Let's, let's get rid of the guy. He says, acquit. No, that's not the Jewish way of doing things. What was going on there? 
Uh, somebody should have said something. The laws of evidence are very complicated. Somebody should have raised a voice against that there. There should have been at least one dissenting vote. Somebody should have made some points there. Uh, somebody did, looked at this. They didn't look at it carefully enough. If it was a whole unanimous decision, there was some kind of collusion there, perhaps. And so if you're having a dissenting vote, that is not necessarily uh, a bad thing. That's a good thing. Whoever is proving something has to prove their case in that. So it's going to say in the ethics of the fathers, there are two types of arguments. There's an argument for the sake of heaven, and there's an argument not for the sake of heaven. What is an argument for the sake of heaven? I'll give you some examples of some of the sages listed here. There's Hillel and Shammai who lived in the time of Jesus. They have disputes throughout the Talmud, total absolute disagreements about what the Jewish law or Jewish practices, completely opposite disagreements on all kinds of, they have many things in common too, but they have dispute after dispute in every tractate of the Talmud about what the Jewish law is. Did that uh, create animosity? Did that create hatred? No. It created a great deal of respect because you know something? One part of the Mishnah says that Hillel and Shammai, although they had different categories of who was considered to be Jewish, who was eligible for Jewish marriage, the, the relatives of Hillel and Shammai intermarried with one another. And they reformed one another who was marrying, if they were fit the various criteria for both of them, they were marrying with that then. And so they disagreed on things, that, and, but the argument was highly praised because what did it do? It strengthened things out. It got the things out. It made people think about things. We go by Hillel's opinion for practical purposes, and there's a reason for that. You know why? Hillel, before he ever gave his own opinion, he let the opponent speak first. And if the opponent didn't get it right, he said, well, just a minute, let me say this louder and louder. So this, this, like this. And then Hillel also was famous for never getting mad at anything. There was a man who lost $400 in his day for trying to make, I bet I can make Hillel mad. So he wouldn't go around to try to insult him, try to annoy him. And he said, oh, you just, that's a good question you're asking. Good question. So just a minute, I've lost money because of you, Hillel. It's better that you lose money than Hillel should lose his temper. And so you have these disputes in there. So that's the example wherever you have Hillel and Shammai, they're discussing things. We're practically following Hillel's opinion. There are other opinions in the Talmud that are not followed, but they're important anyway because they might be studied someday. And we want to understand what the basis was behind the negative opinion for that there. And so that's part of the whole Jewish world. So say, can't you just get on with it? Just do that? Yes, we do that. We, we follow Hillel's things. But there's a practical understanding that's important also. So it's good to know that. What's an argument that's not for the sake of heaven? There's a story. Do you know the story in the book of Numbers, chapter 16, about Korah? The story of Korah there. He has his followers, and he and his followers get together, and they go against Moses and Aaron. says, Moses, why are you leading the people here? Aaron, why do you have the priesthood here? Isn't everybody holy? Can't we all do this here? You try to raise yourselves above everybody here. Can't we just uh, make this all equal and everything? And so it looks like there's an argument between Korah and Moses here about the leadership. But that's not what the ethics of the fathers say. What is an example that, of an argument that is not for the sake of heaven? It's between Korah and Adato. Korah and his followers. Now, what does that mean? If you read the story carefully, you will see, and if you look at most people who are arguing for the bad purpose, you'll see within the dissenting group that there is a, dis there is a disagreement among that group itself. And there are skew purposes there. People who are really doing it for the right thing will get together and have some community in that. But people who are doing it for just for the sake of argument, just strictly for eschewed reasons and that, they will have disputes among themselves. And that's what the ethics of the father says, an argument not for this, it's something like Korah and his followers, because you know something, they didn't agree on things, or they were both fighting among themselves as to who was gonna do things of that then. And so this is one part of things we have here. The ethics of the fathers 
starts out. And why is it with the fathers here? Don't we need some updated language? I'm hearing that phrase. Uh, yeah, maybe, um, but maybe not. We have the tradition that's put together of the people who are doing it. There are male figures there. You can talk, find references to women. Also, the women were there, but they may have been in the background. But that doesn't mean they weren't present. We have this phrase of Mero Ponti, the French philosopher, the prejudice of the actual. We're too much into literal texts and that. Let's, what's going on behind the text? What's going on in the background of the text? What's being said directly? What's not being, what's being unsaid? What's being applied there? If you read carefully, there's a lot of things unwritten, unsaid, but the women play a role within things and that. But it is talking about the fathers, the men and that. And there's a reason for that too, though. If you turn the pages, God forbid, let's just turn the news tonight. If there's been a mass shooting somewhere, if there's been some kind of terrorism somewhere, if there's been some wanton act of war somewhere, if there's been some swindle on Wall Street, some sexual perversion or rape, something like that, who has caused it usually? A man or a woman? Usually a man, not just in our day and time, but throughout history of that. And so, what the Jewish tradition is looking at here, we're creating a male society here, not a chauvinistic society, but it's saying, you, you know, the people of the Greco-Roman times when this was written, they're busy going about doing things, fighting in war, getting involved in commerce and things like this. We're going to have a group of men, but they're not going to battle each other. They're not going to conquer things. They're going to have a conquest of ideas and words and argue among themselves over a biblical text and find things from that to make life better. And that's what the arguments could be. They might shout a little bit, they might pound on the desk, but that's going to be the battle of that, not going out and bashing things and causing mayhem in the world and that. So this is what the ethics of the fathers is trying to do. And the book is, uh, I'll give you sources for it. I'll pass this around. If you'll pass this around, to others, I'll give you to be able to send it out. You can find this themselves, study it for yourself. I would advise you in your communities, if you go back to them, the ethics of the fathers can be read. It's an English translation of that, but the ethics of the fathers is not to be read, even though you can do that. It has to be studied and it has to be studied with somebody who knows some of the background behind it. For the first instance, that means a Jewish person, a rabbi, a learned person, who knows some of the history and background of it. You can read it for yourself and get some of the ideas, but there's a lot of things there, and you don't necessarily have to read it in the order it is there. You can read it in various places. And what I would do is select things out that I think are most relevant according to people's interests. There's a rule, Ain Mu Harvey, but there's no earlier later in Jewish study, and that you can say the first, last, last, first, and so whatever it is. I've taken this into prisons before. And it speaks to anybody of any religion. Some of them are more specifically Jewish, but many of them are quite general. Many of them speak to general common intelligence that anybody of any culture, any religion has. And it, there's no theology there. There's no complicated creeds or anything that anybody has to adhere to. Just listen to the common sense and see if it makes sense to you. And if it does, go back into your community, find a local rabbi or a teacher there and see if they can do a little module program for you and some of your people. I think you'll find some interesting things here because this David Atwood on Prince Edward Island, he and I have a session with this each week and we learn these sayings of the fathers and these sayings go into his sermons every week. And his sermons are outstanding for somebody who's just barely starting in the ministry. He's bringing a whole life experience to it, but he's getting things out of this. And so this is, I share this with you here. Now let's look at the first one here. I maybe you should have got it here, but you'll read it and follow with me here. The first one says, Moses received, now it says, the translation says the Torah, but there's no definite article in the Hebrew. It says Moses received Torah from Sinai, not necessarily the five books. That may be the case of arguments about that, as you know, from biblical studies in school. But whatever it is, Moses received Torah from Mount Sinai. And he passed it on to different people, to Joshua, 
Joshua passed it on to the elders. You can see these people described in the book of Judges. The elders passed it on to the prophets and the prophets to the members of the great assembly. Now, who are the members of the great assembly? These are the people described in those books. You don't read very much in the Bible. You get the lecture, you get a little bit of it, but there are the people described in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, and then the, also the authors of the book of Chronicles. But in Ezra and Nehemiah, you have these people who came back from Babylonia, and they were the sofrim, they were the readers, the scholars in this. And there were people who came back, they built the temple, and they came back and did things. But just a minute, something happened while they were in exile there. They did not have a temple there. And so was the religion over? No. They didn't have the temple there, but they studied the laws of the temple written in the books of the Bible. They wrote some books themselves there. They wrote some of the Psalms there. And most of all, they read and studied those books. And you can see in Ezra and Nehemiah the discussions that people had over that. It wasn't just going back. Now, did those people come back and say, okay, we've got a new thing here. Let's start a new religion here. No, let's keep the old religion going. We've got the temple, but let's build the temple there. Book of Haggai talks about building the temple. Let's build the temple. It's going to do that then. Ezra was part of the priestly class. Let's build the temple, but we're going to have both of them operate at the same time. Just because we've got the temple back, we don't have to throw away these commentaries and studies and tradition we started in Babylonia and brought back. We can keep both of them going. What ended up happening was, is that the tradition of the reading and study of the Bible, eventually, without abolishing the priesthood, without abolishing the temple in Jerusalem, eventually the temple was destroyed, but the game was not over then because Judaism moved to a new phase where they were studying and reading books, arguing about books, learning books, having a give and take about books, seeing if it applied to life. What instance did it apply to? This? this is what Jewish tradition was. This is what the ethics of the fathers is. A series of sayings of various people who start from the time of... The sermon could continue later. Okay. Come on. One second. Anyway, let me give you one example here. Hillel. And you'll hear an alliteration here. You mean an Eli Mealy. If I am not for myself, who is for me? If I am only for myself, who am I? And if not now, when? Now, these are things here. There are often things, several phrases put together. It's up to you to decide what it is, what is it saying, what is it not saying, what is it eliminating saying. And if you see three things put together, four things put together, two things, sometimes they're paradoxical. Why are they put together? That's for you to figure out yourself. It's not something just to be read. It's something to be argued with and figured out from that then. If you're interested in this, get in touch with me. I'd be glad to help you start a module sometime online or something like this. Or again, go to your own communities and do this. But I think you would find, if you looked into this book, you would find tools that you could use with everyday people in your congregation that speaks to secular people. You don't have to be deeply theological, deeply godly or that. It's everyday language that speaks to people. That I think it would be a great tool to use in your congregations. With all due respect. Great wisdom. Thank you. Okay. Rabbi Ellis, this is a gift from the Presbyterian Church for you. Thanks for your wisdom. We're in a kind of a rush, but you know, we will we will definitely. I I've heard some things that I will um, ask. Maybe the work is not to complete, <laughs> but you can't desist from it either. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Thank you.